Aloha, guys. Welcome, everyone, and welcome, everyone out there on the internet. We are here to worship Jesus. Amen? All right, well, let's get to it. If you guys want to stand up, I'm going to just pray, and we're going to get started. Lord, we love you. God, we ask that this evening, the songs that we sing, the, the attitudes of our heart, God, that we would bring pleasure to your, your heart, Lord Jesus, that, that we, would, we would be able to really glorify you here in this place, that we would lift up your name in a way that is pure, that is true, that is full of love and, and just integrity. God, we trust you. We love you. We worship you here tonight. In your name we pray.
Lord, we so, we so appreciate these moments. We savor these moments with you, Lord God, and it's, it's worth driving up from Kona. It's worth changing my life plans, Lord God, and seeing everything that I thought I was going to do just fade into the light because you've done such amazing things. You've been so faithful again and again and again to expand my vision, to help all of us make it through each day, but also fix our eyes on the great things that you have on the horizon that you have prepared for us. We love you, Jesus, and we're so grateful for your faithfulness and your goodness to us. Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold like a vow that is tested like a covenant of old Your love is enduring through the winter rain beyond the horizon with mercy for today place, Lord Jesus. Be glorified, be lifted up. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mahalo, Joel. Do me a favor, everybody. Give Joel a thank you. And turn and uh, do an air a wave or a high five or a shock at each other. We've got two, two families across the room here tonight. 
We're glad that you guys are here with us. Glad that you guys are online watching as well. Uh, don't forget to share and make sure we extend our reach as much as possible on Facebook. Don't forget there's three ways to support the church financially. Number one, you can use the Yay God boxes out in the lobby. You can give online using that uh, address that you see on the screen, or you can send it to the P.O. box. All three of those are great ways to support the church financially. We appreciate your help. Every single penny helps. Well, we're in a 10-part Wednesday night series right now. It's all based on the amazing word kaleo. Kaleo in Greek means to call to someone with your voice, to call them to action or to an office or to a purpose. And then also in Alelo Hawaii, the Hawaiian language, it's a male name that is translated as the voice or the sound in English. So it's interesting to me that both languages spell the word the same, pronounce the word in similar ways, and they both have to do with a voice or a call to action. So we've been talking about five callings of God, five different ways the voice of God calls each of us to action, the kaleo of akua, if you will. And so far we've talked about the first four of the five, uh, the first four kaleo of akua. Number one, we're called to care. We're called to show compassion. Number two, we're called to worship, the kaleo of worship. Three, we're all called to serve, the kaleo of service. And then tonight we're talking about the first part of the fifth and final kaleo. Of course, there are more than five callings from God, but these are the five I chose to share with you at this time. So if you're ready to hear what God has put on my heart to share with you tonight, would you do me a favor and either say or type, hit me with it, G, I'm ready. Awesome. This week and next week, we're going to see that we are called to be holy. We're called to holiness. So many times in Scripture, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, God calls us to be holy, to practice holiness. 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16 is just one of many similar examples. He writes, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy... So you be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. And then in Hebrews 12, 14, we read a very serious statement. Make every effort, every effort, to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. We say, whoa, think about that for a minute. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So I guess it's pretty obvious then, it's very important for us to understand what holiness is and how we're to practice holiness in our lives. And so in order to talk about holiness, the holiness of God though, first, tonight we need to talk about music. Uh, Most of you know already, I love music, almost all music. Annette and I have been watching The Masked Singer, we're totally hooked, and so I'm just singing constantly all week long. I love all music. Old old school country western isn't a favorite of mine. Most rap I have very little patience for. But other than that, I have pretty eclectic music tastes. And of course, I love to sing. I always have. You all know by now that I like to sing you some songs like the piano man, right? I like singing about sweet home Alabama. Even more, I like rewriting the lyrics to songs like that and singing sweet home up in heaven. Where the skies are so blue, sweet home up in heaven, Lord, I'm coming home to you. And I like to sing along even with Taylor Swift, right? Because the player's going to play, 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 and the hater's going to hate, 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 hate. But I'm just going to shake, 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 shake it off, shake it off. Didn't know I knew Taylor, right? So when it comes to music, though, I really love to sing songs to Jesus, songs that point other people to the love of Jesus. I love old hymns like Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I really love the great modern praise and worship songs like you're amazing, faithful, Love's open door when I'm empty. You fill me with hunger for more of your mercy, your goodness. Lord, you're the air that I breathe. That's who you are to me. 
Now, of course, all of those songs, when it's not a cappella, they're back with drums or electric guitar or bass guitar or keyboards. So much more fun to listen to, so much more fun to sing. I love Chris Tomlin and Lady A's song, singing that song in particular. And so Victor Hugo, he once said, music expresses that which cannot be said and on which it is impossible to be silent. I love that. I love it. Plato said, music is a moral law. It gives soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, and charm and gaiety to life and to everything. Music is a gift from God that captures and carries emotions that just can't adequately be expressed by words alone. God commands us to use music and to sing for His glory. That's one of the things I'm most thankful for this year. It's been such a weird, weird, weird year with COVID, but one of the great, great positive highlights of my year is that the Lord led Joel to us, and he's been able to bring this wonderful level of musical ability and giftedness and talentedness in leading us into the presence of God. I'm just so thankful that Joel is here. And so the Word of God has a lot to say about music and says that music was created for God's glory. One passage, Psalm 98, 4 says, shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth, break forth and sing for joy and sing praises. That was actually the inspiration behind Isaac Watts's joy to the world that we're going to be uh, singing and preaching on in just a couple of weeks. And so God loves music. God created music. And in fact, scripture says our God is a great singer too. Did you know that? Did you know that God sings too? Scripture says he does. The Lord your God is with you, Zephaniah says. The mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with what? Singing. The Lord sings. In fact, there are some indications that God not only spoke the universe into being, God may have actually sung it into existence. The words for speak and sing are the same in Hebrew. He could have said, let there be light, right? He could have done it that way. We don't know. Even today, we can see that all matter vibrates at its own unique frequency, similar to vocal cords. You and I are made of matter. We all vibrate with a specific frequency. We're all part of the initial creative song of God. And so I find that whenever I want to express an emotion, whether it's joy or sadness or peace or contentment, I do it best when I do it through music. Music is very important, a very important element of worship when it comes to connecting our hearts, our passion to God. By the way, do you know what the first recorded song in the Bible is about? I'll give you a hint. The last song recorded in the Bible is about the exact same subject. Interesting. The first song in Scripture and the last song in Scripture. The first is found in Exodus 15. The last can be found in Revelation 15. And both of them have as their shared focus praising the holiness of God. Just as He is holy, we are called to be holy. During the Exodus, God demolished any possible validity to the power of Egypt's false gods. He proved that they were just myths, just projections of the imaginations of the people who followed them. Once they were on the other side of the Red Sea, Moses led the whole nation of Israel in a song that celebrated God's holiness. And the lyrics are recorded for us in Exodus 15, though we no longer know what the melody was. It was lost to antiquity, right? We don't know what, how it went. And whenever I encounter songs that I know it's a song in Scripture and the tune has been lost to antiquity, I sometimes just like to make up my own melody. I look at a, a, a song that I know well, a melody that I know well, and say, how, what, what would fit with these lyrics? So maybe it went something like this. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both the horse and the driver, he is hurled into the sea. I mean, could be, right? We don't know. It could have gone like that. 
One verse that really captures the gist of that entire song is verse 11. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. I just love that description of God, that God is not just holy, but majestic in holiness, that he is awesome in glory, the uttermost limit of glory and holiness. And we constantly and consistently see this description throughout the Bible from the very beginning to the very end. In the last book of the Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ given to the Apostle John, we see another song about the holiness of God. John tells us, I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea those who had been victorious over the beast and its image over the number of its name they held harps given them by god and sang the song of god's servant moses and of the lamb great and marvelous are your deeds lord god almighty just and true are your ways king of the nations who will not fear you lord and bring glory to your name for you alone are holy all nations will come and worship before you for your righteous acts have been revealed now of course in between exodus 15 and revelation 15 god's holiness comes up again and again and again and the word holy is used more often as a prefix to god's name than any other adjective in scripture Isaiah in the Old Testament, John in the New Testament, two different men in Scripture separated by thousands of years who were both permitted to see into the throne room of heaven, and they both wrote about it and both reported hearing one continuous refrain being sung there day and night. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We've got that great old hymn, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. And then Chris Tomlin and Louis Giglio wrote a great song inspired by this same verse as well. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy, holy, holy. The holiness of God. Holiness is the only attribute of God that is repeated three times in a row like this in Scripture. I think that's because Father, Son, Holy Spirit, each holy, our holy triune God, the Trinity. And so among all the other things that we can say about God, the fact that He is holy, 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 perfectly holy, totally holy, is the most significant, the most important thing. And so tonight, I believe God sent me here to share something with you, whether you're here in person with me tonight or whether you're watching online. And what God wants me to share, I think, is so mysterious, so uh, disquieting, so awesome that when I fully pause and reflect on these truths, I'll be honest with you, it, it, it just makes me tremble a little bit. It's kind of overwhelming. I see the work of your hands, galaxies spin in a heavenly dance, oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming, and I hear the sound of your voice, all at once it's a gentle and thundering noise, oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming. I delight myself in you, captivated by your beauty. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. And God, I run into your arms, unashamed because of mercy. And I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. So let's ask this question, what the holiness of God really means. Let's be overwhelmed by the answer. Let's ask the question in this day, when our God is so commonly ridiculed, dismissed, misrepresented, ignored, let's especially think about what this word holy really means and what holiness really has to do with us. What does it mean to say God is holy? 
Well, the word holy actually has a double focus. So we're going to talk about each of them a little bit. One of them we're going to talk about this week, and then we're going to conclude this series next week as we talk about the second focus of the word holy. Let's talk about the first one. The first focus of the word holy is that holy means to be distinct or separate or unique. It's all connected to the word sanctify or sanctified or sacred, and they all mean the same thing, to be set apart from that which is not holy, to be set apart for God's use, for God's purposes, for God's glory, to be totally different, to be wholly other than everything else surrounding you. And so when we say God is holy, we're not just talking about that being one characteristic of many different characteristics of God. We're talking about the very character, the very nature of God himself. Holiness, when that word is applied to God, it means that he is utterly unique, utterly separate. He is incomparable. He is matchless. He is without parallel. He is without peer. In Isaiah 40, verse 25, God himself issues this challenge. He says, to whom will you compare me? And the way it's written, the verb tense that it's written in in Hebrew, is an automatic understood answer of nobody. You, you can't compare God to anything else or anyone else. He says, or who is my equal? Again, it assumes a negative answer the way it's written in the original Hebrew. Whom will you compare me? Who is my equal, says the Holy One. And the answer is just implied in the question. There is no comparison. You are unique. You are incomparable. You are matchless. You are indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God, all-powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, you are amazing God. See, God is not just a supersized version of you or me. He's not just a way better version of you or me. He is transcendently separate. He is in a class all by himself. He is subject to nothing. He answers to no one. He has always been and he will always be. He's not subject to the limitations of time or space or energy because he created all of those things. None of those things existed before God brought them into being. He is holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, H-O-L-Y. He is holy, holy. This is who our holy God is. And all through Scripture, we have accounts of the people of God in their moment of revelation, when they finally grasped on some level the level of infinite holiness, the, the complete uniqueness of God. They see Him in a vision of some kind. They're overwhelmed with the love and the mercy of God, and they're undone by that situation. They're full of fear. They're full of awe because they're experiencing a being who is so far beyond description, so far beyond understanding, so different from all else they've ever known in their life that they, their immediate reaction was fear. And so this is the first focus of meaning in the Bible about the holiness of God. He is not like anything else. He is not like anyone else that we can possibly come up with in our wildest imagination. He is so far above us. He is so far beyond us. And he tells us himself through the prophet Isaiah in verse 55, uh, chapter 55, verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. God is holy. He is so wholly different and so wholly rare, and so wholly glorious, and so wholly awesome, and so wholly magnificent that no one in the Bible, regardless of how devout, how faithful, how learned they were, none of them failed to crumble in fear and humility and repentance when they just caught even the tiniest glimpse of our holy God. And when God met the prophet Habakkuk, Habakkuk described his reaction like this. I heard and I trembled within. My lips quivered at the sound. Rottenness entered my bones. I trembled where I stood. He was 
shattered by what he saw. He was full of fear. And Isaiah, in the throne room of God, reacted the same way. He said, woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. I'm a sinful person. And I live among a people of unclean lips. They're sinful people. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. The Apostle John reacted the same way when he was confronted in his vision of the risen Christ. In Revelation 1.17, he turns, he hears a voice that sounds like many rushing waters, and he turns and he sees Jesus, and he says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, like he passed out and just collapsed right in front of him. And Jesus, he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. See, when we see God for who he really is, holy, 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 it traumatizes us because we immediately understand ourselves for who we really are compared to him. And the incongruence is overwhelming. In multiple places in Scripture, we find this proverb, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, this word fear, we, we often try to water it down a little bit. We say, oh, I don't want to be afraid of God. That's not what the word means. And so we say, oh, it just means respect and awe instead of fear. Well, not really. While it's true that God wants to be a loving father to us, that God wants to be a friend to us, and that fear in Scripture does contain the concepts of awe and respect as well, I think sometimes we go too far with that characterization. And there are people who portray God as sort of, you know, just one of the boys. You know, somebody I can hang out with, have coffee with, I can confide in him, I can call on him when the going gets tough, regardless of my relationship with him, regardless of what kind of life I'm leading, regardless of what kind of sins are still oozing and seeping through my life. And I hear people call him the big guy or the man upstairs. I heard one pastor once refer to God as Jesus' old man. No, no. I am all for bringing the gospel to people using pop culture illustrations, but dumbing down God in that way, I think it just goes too far. Contrast that very trivializing next-door neighbor view of God to who God himself says he is when he says it to Israel. He says, you thought that I was just like you. You thought that I was just like you that I wasn't separate from you, that I wasn't unique, that I wasn't holy. I will reprove you and state the case in order before your eyes. Now consider this, you who, are, who forget God, or I will tear you in pieces and there will be none to deliver. God reminds us, listen, it's a dangerous thing to forget that God is holy. He is unique. He is completely other than who we are and we sometimes trifle with the him to our own peril he's not the big guy he's not the man upstairs he's not jesus's old man he's not our co-pilot he is our god he is our creator he's the sovereign king of creation deuteronomy 4 24 reminds us for the lord your god is a consuming fire a jealous God. Now I'm in the presence of Almighty God, and yes, our God, He is a consuming fire, and the flames burn down deep in my soul. Yes, our God, He is a consuming fire, and He reaches inside, and He melts down this cold heart of stone. Let the mystery of who God is strike deep in your heart tonight he doesn't fit into any of our neat little theological ideas he cannot be defined he cannot be contained by our finite minds his way is not just one way of a hundred equally valid ways to consider on one hand or the other he is holy w-h-o-l-l-y holy h-o-l-y he is holy holy He's holy, entirely, completely, other, separate, above you and me. We are not equals with him. We are simply the finite creation of the infinite creator. 
Let that soak in for a minute tonight. We are simply the finite creation of the infinite creator. And yet, this God, this incredibly other, unique, holy, separate from us God, loves you. He loves you. He knows you. He wants what's best for you. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. He wants to be in a relationship with you. But you need to come to Him with that understanding, that level of respect, that level of fear, that level of awe, that level of wonder, knowing He's not just the guy next door. He's not the man upstairs. He is your Creator. He is only, only, only holy, holy, holy. So let's stop on that idea tonight. We're going to pick up with the other focus of what it means to be holy next week as we conclude this Kaleo series. Joel's going to come and lead us in our closing song. Let's pray together. Oh, Father God, you are holy. You are amazing. You are indescribable. We're overwhelmed. We're overwhelmed when we think about who you are, God. We try to wrap our brains around who you are, how you exist, how you operate, what your thoughts are, what your ways are. It's so far beyond what we can even remotely imagine. And sometimes we forget that. We get so arrogant. We get so full of ourselves and we begin to think of ourselves as little gods. Nothing could be further from the truth. We are the finite creation of our infinite creator. And so God, because we know that you love us and because we know that you want the best for us, even though if we saw you in all of your glory right now, we would wisely collapse to the ground in fear and terror because you're so different from anything we can imagine. You would just like Jesus did to John, you would place your hand on our shoulder and say, you don't need to be afraid of me. I love you and I have a plan and a purpose for your life. Follow me. Trust me. God, I pray for all of us tonight that even though we can't ever hope to fully understand you, that if we could just begin to get a glimpse, a tiny glimpse of your holiness, of your glory, if we could just be a little bit more like you every day, if at the end of every day we could say, I know God a little bit better, and I love God a little bit more than I did yesterday. I'm a little bit more like God today than I was yesterday. Even though it's such a tiny, small, infinitesimally small step compared to the infiniteness of who you are, we can still move toward you, toward your holiness, toward your love. So God, help us do that. Help us every day, finish the day, being able to honestly say, I know God a little bit better, I love God a little bit more, and I'm a little bit more like God than I was yesterday. No matter what else has happened today, if, if at the end of the day, no matter how many things went wrong, no matter how many mistakes I made, how much trouble I had, if at the end of the day, if that's all I could say, I know God a little bit better, love God a little bit more and I'm a little bit more like him I, I grew a tiny bit in holiness today then that day has been a good day and the flip side is true as well if everything went right today and I scored big on the stock market or I got a new job or I, I just in, you know hit the lottery and got a billion dollars if everything went right in my day but at the end of the night I can't honestly say I'm a little bit more like God. I love God a little bit more. I know God a little bit better. If I can't say those things, then regardless of what else happened today, this day has been a total abysmal failure. It doesn't count anything towards eternity. So God, help us focus on this idea of how holy you are, how separate, how unique, how transcendent, how overwhelming you are. And help us never take you for granted. Help us always keep that understanding at the top of our consciousness. Help us worship you tonight, Lord, for who you really are. 
and help us be as your creation people who are holy w-h-o-l-l-y yours that's my prayer for all of us tonight in jesus name amen Worship you, Lord God, tonight. You alone are holy. And we join with the angels in heaven and we sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth are filled with your glory. We love you, Lord God. We praise you here tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for joining. Aloha.